There are seven back-to-back -back sea days crossing the Atlantic on Cunard Queen Mary II. Not surprisingly, many people tell me one of the biggest fears they have about doing a transatlantic is getting bored witless with not enough to occupy them. I must admit I too was apprehensive heading off again on the crossing that I have just done because after doing many sea day heavy cruises since cruising resumed, I too was getting rather bored on sea days. Welcome aboard. I'm Gary Bembridge. Join me as I look at this and the two other biggest fears people tell me they have about doing a Cunard Queen Mary II crossing. There's four things I quickly discovered about getting bored. First of all, I saw again that a Cunard crossing has the most packed daily program of any line, any ship and any itinerary I have ever been on. Cunard have been crossing the Atlantic for over 180 years. They definitely know how to keep us busy. On my crossing, there were between four and seven activities every single hour starting for around nine o'clock in the morning right through until midnight. However, while the daily program is packed full of activities, they are very classical cruising activities. So while they suit me, I realize they may not suit all of you. Let me explain. There are three signature and wildly popular activities that I personally absolutely love. The first are the Cunard Insight Talks lasting 45 minutes each. These are held three to four times a day. Now, despite being held in the huge Illuminations Theatre, they were often standing room only. On the crossing, there are usually three speakers giving a series of four talks each and one celebrity headline guest speaker. Now on our cruise, that was Lord and Lady Howard. He's an ex-UK government minister and she was a 1960s supermodel. Our experts were General Simon Mayle, who spoke about military history, Susan Barlow, who was an astronomer, Andrew Killigan, who was an ex-stage manager and spoke about musicals, and Captain Rick Reynolds, an ex Concorde pilot. Now I've also been on transatlantics where we've had experts on skyscrapers, Broadway and maritime history. All the speakers really know how to keep passengers engaged because they've spoken on the crossings many times. They know exactly what to do. The next event attended every day by hundreds and hundreds is afternoon tea. Now something regular viewers will know is a passion and weak spot for me afternoon tea. Now on Cunard, afternoon tea is a really big deal and even more so on the crossings. The main event is held in the Grand Queen's Room. Here platters of sandwiches, cakes and scones are constantly whisked around by white gloved waiters. But afternoon tea is also available in King's Court, the buffet, or by room service. Both of those are free. Uh, if you're cruising in Queen's or Princess Grill Suites, you can also have it served in the Grills Lounge or you can have it self-served in the Grills Concierge Lounge. You can also pay, by the way, to have champagne afternoon tea in the Champagne Bar or you can have a Godiva chocolate afternoon tea in Sir Samuel's Coffee Shop. The other signature event are the planetarium shows in Illuminations. Now Queen Mary 2 is the only ship that has a fully active planetarium and they run a series of shows every single day. So those were the three main activities that certainly stopped me getting bored, but there was a lot more to do that may actually appeal much more to you. There were four quizzes and trivia held every day along with daily bingo. I was amazed just how packed these events were. Also, always packed were the three to four dance classes every day, including Zumba, line dancing, and various types of ballroom. Less busy, by the way, were the various paddle tennis, table tennis, deck coits, and dart tournaments, though bridge was a really big draw. There were many informal unhosted get-togethers arranged as well, by the way. Every day there were Christian Fellowship, twice daily solo traveler get-togethers, a late afternoon LGBT meetup, friends of Bill W and hobby meetups every single day. And then occasionally you also would have Women's Institute, Rotary, Masonic, Service Clubs and veteran get-togethers were also listed. Live music was dotted around the ship all throughout the day. There were, for example, a guitar duo playing multiple sets in the lounge, a pianist, a harpist, a string trio and a party band called Changes. Every few days, a full classical piano concert also took place. If you're into crafts, there were watercolor classes twice a day. These were popular and also always packed. 
There were also ad hoc events every day like uh, fruit carving, flower arranging, and of course the inevitable spa and shop seminars. In the evening, the main events were twice nightly shows in the Royal Court Theatre. Now these were a mix of very, very standard cruise production shows, not especially strong or to my liking, supplemented on other nights by the usual, I think predictable, guest artists. Uh, on this crossing, there was a 60s tribute band, a comedian, and a flautist. Cunard, in my view, is weak in the theatre offering overall. They predated themes, predated music, predated staging. Though they are trying to up it a bit recently, I still skipped many of the shows. The casino, to be honest, was a bigger draw for me. The other evening focus is on full balls on former nights and then themed ballroom dancing in the magnificent Queen's Room on other nights. We had jazz, big band, and dance party evenings. They were all well attended and always packed. The third evening activity is for the party crowd with live band and DJ in the G32 nightclub. It's a big space behind the Queen's Room. It kept going until literally people left, but as a fairly early to bed person, I was not one of them. If nothing appeals on the daily program, there is actually even more to do. Queen Mary 2 itself is part of the entertainment. It's the only ocean liner in the world and there is no other ship like it. It's full of quirks, hidden spots, and in fact, lots of stories to explore. For example, Homer Simpson is hidden away in one of these art deco style panels near the Golden Lion pub. There's a much missed scenic lift between deck seven and deck 11, where there's a magnificent open observation platform. There's also a maritime trail with the history of crossings and all about Cunard and the stars that have been on Cunard to follow. There's kennels up on deck 12, which if you find, you'll often see the dogs out there being walked. And very importantly, the wraparound promenade deck, which literally hundreds of people walk every day. Three laps, by the way, equals 1.1 miles. The ship itself is quirky in layout and actually quite hard to find your way around. And exploring the ship is part of the entertainment, as I actually discuss in another video I've made about the ship. Another thing I would say about getting bored is many see this as an opportunity to unwind. My partner, who works crazy hours, adored the crossing because it was a chance to de-stress, relax, and recharge. The Wi-Fi is pretty rubbish, even though it's supposedly been upgraded. And so it also means that he had to disconnect and just relax. I saw many people doing exactly that. Queen Mary 2 is a massive ship, but actually doesn't carry that many guests. There are many nooks and crannies and spots for passengers to sit and read and relax. This is helped, by the way, by an enormous library with over 10,000 books. Once people I speak to about doing a crossing are reassured on not getting bored, many though still worry about not fitting in and it being a stuffy experience. There are three concerns around this that I'd like to talk about. Cunard has a reputation for having a very formal and strictly enforced dress code. Their ads make much of people dressed up in black tie and glamorous gowns. However, you don't need to really stress about it as much as you had to in the past because Cunard have dialed back a lot of the formality and the number of formal dress nights. During the day, people do not dress formally at all. Years ago, when I first went on a crossing, we were worried about that, but you can wear what you'd wear on any other cruise, shorts, flip-flops, jeans, whatever. In the evenings, it is now no more formal than any other UK-based line like Pino Cruises or Fred Olsen, though more formal than American-focused lines like Celebrity, Holland America and Princess. There are two dress codes only now. First of all, five out of the seven nights is called smart attire. All this requires is for gentlemen a collared shirt, which can be short or long-sleeved, and smart trousers. For ladies, blouses, skirts, stylish dresses, or trousers are what they recommend. In practice, the vast majority actually dress a little bit more smartly th than this. I certainly wore a jacket every one of these evenings, as I'd say about 60% or more of the other men from what I could see. There are now just two gala evenings. They are no longer called formal nights. To get into the main restaurants, the theater, and most bars, men are asked to wear a dinner jacket, tuxedo, or dark suit and tie, or bow tie, ladies' evening or cocktail dresses. Those that didn't want to dress up could eat in King's Court, go to the casino, and the Corinthia Lounge, though many ignored the rule about not going to the theater unless in gala dress code. I estimate over 90% of guests dressed up in line with a dress code on gala nights, and 90% of that 90% in black tie. You could go on a crossing and not dress up, but however, dressing up for most, including me, is part of the experience. 
I do wonder if these changes will neither satisfy those that did the crossing for the old-fashioned formality, nor those that don't want to dress up at all on their vacation. Time will tell. Another concern raised to me by many people is a feeling that they may not fit in. And this is around the perceived class system on Cunard. Many ask me if you're not in the grills experience, if you do feel and get treated as a second class citizen. Now the Cunard class system is linked to the main dining rooms. If you're traveling in Queen's Grill, which are the biggest suites, you eat in the Queen's Grill restaurant. If you're in Princess Grill, which are the smaller sized suites, you eat in the Princess Grill. And if you're crossing in Britannia, which are the balcony, ocean view and inside cabins, you eat in Britannia restaurant. Or if in the upper grade Britannia cabins, balcony cabins, you eat in Britannia club, which is a section within the main restaurant. I believe about 85% of the passengers on board the ship are actually Britannia guests. So while Cunard make a lot of noise about the girls' experience on board, it is actually no different and probably not as segregated as on pretty much every other mid to large sized ship that I've been on. In fact, girls' passengers have fewer, smaller and less spectacular facilities and areas dedicated to them than I've had when cruising in a suite on many lines, including Celebrity, Norwegian Cruise Line and MSC Cruises. While other lines are creating access controlled ship within a ship for suites like MSC Yacht Club and Norwegian Haven, on Queen Mary 2 there is only, in addition to the restaurants, a grills lounge, which is rather uninspiring and the public ones are in fact much, much nicer. There's a small concierge lounge, which is a plus because you do have someone who will handle shore excursions and transfers and a concierge who will help sort out any problems and you then don't have to queue at the purses desk downstairs, which always has a long queue. There's also a small grills deck on the rear of the ship with a hot tub, which very few people use that deck on a transatlantic crossing because the weather isn't actually that great for sitting out anyway. At check-in, while there was a priority lane, it covered grills passengers as well as diamond and platinum frequent travelers, no matter the cabin grade. I would say well into 90% or more of the ship is open to everybody and I feel that you get more perks and dedicated spaces when cruising in a suite on other lines. I get asked often if a Cunard crossing is only for older travelers and if it's full of snooty, stuffy, posh people. This is not my experience at all. While absolutely the vast majority are couples and they're in their 50s, 60s and 70s, there are many groups of 40 something friends traveling together Always multi-generational families are on board too. Plenty of solo travelers too, helped a little bit more by the solo cabins that Cunard have added to the ship. There's also many LGBT travelers, particularly gay male couples. I get contacted frequently by gay travelers worried that Cunard passengers will be very traditional and very conservative and not at all welcoming. I have never seen this. There will often be, for example, same-sex couples dancing ballroom in the Queen's Room and in fact their dance skill will be of more interest than anything else. Most travellers, by the way, are British, American, Canadian and Australians. Though you do get a smattering, of course, of all nationalities. Many people also ask me if kids fit in. My answer is no, not really. There will be very few on board and while there are kids and teen clubs, they pale into insignificance versus the much more family orientated lines. The program, as I've covered, is not geared towards kids and teens, and they probably will not meet many other kids to have fun with. While it's not an adult only line, I get the real strong sense that travelers expect their crossing to be very much an adult experience. And I've probably even seen eyes roll a little bit when they see the few kids that are on board coming into the dining rooms. Not surprisingly, and I'm sure you are thinking this too, one huge concern about the crossing is the weather and seasickness. Both are without any doubt risks, no matter what time of the year you go. But there are a few things that you need to know that will help you. Queen Mary 2 is a liner. It's specifically designed to cross the Atlantic. It's designed to be incredibly stable through the hull shape with powerful stabilizers as well. I find Queen Mary 2 is definitely much more stable than any other regular cruise ship. The other really critical thing about the ship being designed to cross the Atlantic is the key public venues and the restaurants are first of all much lower down in the ship and often much more midship than you generally find on traditional cruise ships. If you want to know more, I cover this in much more detail in my video about Queen Mary 2. 
but the North Atlantic is unpredictable and it's very varied. But if you want a high chance of a smoother crossing, then of course go midsummer. And if you want big waves, then go in winter. Now my partner, for example, Mark, is very prone to seasickness, but he has only ever got seasick on winter crossings and never in any summer crossing, despite some days inevitably where there's quite a bit of movement. Personally, I like May-June time as it's less costly than peak summer and have had some of the smoothest crossings I've ever had then. Every time I go, I will though be honest with you, I do meet people who got seasick. So I always recommend taking these precautions. First of all, pack motion sickness medicine or the patches, have those at the ready. Second, if you're worried about it, book a cabin midship. I always, always, always book a midship cabin, even though touch wood, I've never been seasick. Go on really low decks too, if you are really concerned, like deck four, five, or six. Thirdly, remember that if you do feel seasick, you can go to the medical center and get a jab. It knocks you out for a couple of hours, but then will make you feel fantastic. So that's your kind of fallback insurance. Also, by the way, pack layers as it's gonna be windy and often chilly out on the deck, no matter what time of the year that you go. If you found this interesting, I want to know more about Queen Mary 2 and what to expect. Watch my video here about the ship where I also discuss if critics are right to say the ship is now well past her prime. See you over there.